right, so welcome to the second Silicon Valley Skeptics talk. Um, our speaker today, Dr. Tremel, received a PhD in physics from Columbia University. He worked in the Columbia Astrophysics Lab under advisor Professor Gary Channon. He is the former vice president of software at Atari. And since retiring from Atari, he has been advocating for improved science education and currently sits on the board of directors at Center for Inquiry and the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry Executive Council. Please help me welcome Dr. Leonard Trammell. I need to push a button. Which button do I need to push? This working? Oh darn, that means you can hear me. All right. So welcome. This isn't going to be a strictly science talk because this is Silicon Valley skeptics. So what is skepticism? But the question of why do we really think these things are true? What is the evidence to back it up? So let's start with what is science. So science is the best way we know of to determine what's true. And as I see it, consists of two parts. The iterative nature of science, the fact that we constantly repeat our efforts to improve our knowledge is what makes it powerful. Because we know our understanding is going to change, all ideas are accepted only tentatively. This is a vitally important point for two reasons. First, it shows us that our knowledge is likely to improve. Second, and even more important, our current state of knowledge can be, and often is, deeply flawed, but still extremely useful. This point is important when dealing with what I call the enemies of science, who will attack our knowledge saying things like, that's only a theory, or this theory is obviously flawed. Okay, that doesn't mean it's not useful. The requirement for perfection, besides being rather optimistic, is contrary to the iterative nature of science, and these criticisms are simultaneously true and completely without content. Which brings us back to skepticism. The requirement that an assertion is considered to be likely true only if it accounts for the available evidence, both positive and negative. Evidence is considered positive for an assertion if it matches the idea's predictions, and negative if the evidence cannot be accounted for. But in the absence of new evidence, a well-established idea will not be abandoned. This inherent conservatism is a fundamental characteristic of science, not to be confused with political conservatism. It takes good, solid evidence, and if possible, lots of it, to get a new idea to be accepted. And this means that bad ideas are unlikely to get through the process, but it also means that flawed ideas are able, sometimes, to stick around for a while, even when there is evidence that they shouldn't. So why do we do science? Why do we need to do science? Human intuition is the result of evolutionary processes that made us more likely to survive on the plains of Africa. So we shouldn't expect them to be particularly well-crafted to unraveling the mysteries of the universe. If I drop something, I expect it to fall. This is obvious. Things fall. But if we were intelligent ocean creatures, the direction things go would depend on their density. Now, this is true for us, too, but we didn't evolve with helium-filled balloons, so we don't consider that. So science is the way to overcome our limits and refine our knowledge of the natural world. I like to view science and lots of other things pragmatically. A scientific idea is worth accepting, at least provisionally, as true, if it's useful. In this context, useful has a very definite meaning. The ability to make a prediction that is confirmed in reality. The more situations where it's useful and the fewer assumptions that are made, the better. The other hand, an observed phenomenon that is, that is not explained counts against the ideas. So some hypotheses are better than others. For example, you have two hypotheses that are able to explain the same thing. One has lots of adjustable parameters. The other has a few. The fewer, the better. 
well, why? So if you have too many adjustable, parameter, uh, adjustable parameters, you can use a process called curve fitting, otherwise known as cheating. So let's say you've performed an experiment on some new phenomenon and you obtained a set of data points. There they are. You know that there's quite a bit of noise in this data, but it's a new result, so you want to publish. So suppose someone says they have a theory that predicts the result of your experiment. They use your results to adjust for the details of your experiment, and they give you this. Obviously, they cheated. In order to get every wiggle just right, they had to construct a model with so many free parameters that it got everything right. And this is literally too good to be true. So you also get two other replies, and they look like this. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. So at this point, with no other information, you don't know what to choose. So what do you do? Well, you get better data um, or more theorists. So now with the better data, it's obvious that which of the, uh, the previous examples that best fit this, uh, which model best fits the observations. So how does this work in the real world? So everyone's heard of Newton's laws of motion and the universal law of gravity. So how do they stack up to this test? Newtonian gravity can be expressed in one equation. And this equation has precisely one adjustable parameter, capital G. Yet it has been shown highly, but not perfectly accurate, to describe the motions of everything in the universe, which is kind of impressive. Now, if we want to be ultra skeptical, which we should be, there are six adjustable parameters in this theory. Do you multiply the things together? Which do you multiply? What do you divide? What exponents do you use? But there are lots of reasons for setting the uh, equation up this way. But that's pretty remarkable. One equation with just one variable number gets everything right. Well, close. So as some of you probably know and all of you have heard, there's this thing called general relativity which showed that this equation isn't quite right. But you can derive this equation from general relativity and under the conditions where we do most things, this is an awfully good approximation. So let's look at another example of how this works, the field of cosmology. So cosmology is the study of the structure of the universe and how it got that way. For most of humanity's history, this has been exclusively the realm of religion, and the ideas look like the image on the screen. But in the last century, we have been able to make reasonable statements backed by evidence on this subject. And shocking as it is to me, we are now in what is called the age of precision cosmology. We finally have a cosmological model that makes sense and quite accurately predicts the results of experiments. To understand what this model says, we need to understand what's being explained. So what is actually observed when you look at the universe? So I'm going to concentrate on five specific observations. First, around 1910, it was possible to measure the distance to a certain subset of stars all the way across the galaxy. And later in that decade, this was extended to a few of the brightest galaxies. So how many of you have heard of something called redshift? How many of you know at least vaguely what that means? OK. So very, very roughly, it's analogous to sound. When something's coming at you, the, way, the frequency goes up. When it's going away, the frequency goes down. So as a siren goes by, it goes, hmm. Except light doesn't make sound. It has color corresponding to the frequency. So something coming at you is blue shifted. Something going away from you is red shifted. So objects were found. Almost every distant object was found to be red shifted. The universe was spinning away from us. Um, Edwin Hubble noticed that there was a linear relationship between distance and redshift. Now, it's often said that for every equation, you lose half your audience. Um, hopefully, that's not true in this case. 
in which case I've already lost three quarters of you because this is the second equation. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep going. Um, this equation says that velocity is equal to the distance to the object times h sub zero, the Hubble constant. In the century since Hubble's work, using his namesake space telescope and lots of other equipment, we've confirmed this relationship. And if we accept this, we can use redshift to determine distance over the entire visible universe. But should we? Should we be skeptical? Well, there have been attempts to explain the observed redshift um, by other phenomenon. Uh, none of them have worked very well. Uh, one of the persistent ones is something called tired light theory. It says that light slowly loses energy it travels through space. This can happen if, for example, light scatters off some intervening material. However, in this case, distant objects would be blurred. That's not observed, so this idea has been rejected over and over. We keep looking for ways to explain this without um, velocity, but no one's figured it out. So at this point, no mechanism can be no, is known to explain this tired light, and it really doesn't help, but there, it places interesting limits on some things, so it's a, it's a useful scientific question. So let's accept this, because there are no known exceptions. It's been verified many times, and as I'll point out soon, it's predicted by a well-established theory. The next thing revealed by the data is what the universe looks like, how the material is distributed. And if the previous ex um, equation didn't lose half of you, perhaps this will. The universe is said to be homogeneous if it's the same everywhere. Looking around you, you can't tell where you are on a large scale. This pattern is homogeneous. On a scale larger than a stripe, you can't tell where you are, assuming this went on forever. But it isn't the same in all directions, so it's not isotropic. Traveling along one of the lines is very different than traveling at right angles. So are there any patterns that are isotropic and not homogeneous? Yes, here's one, clearly isotropic, the same in all directions, not homogeneous. If you're not near the center, things look very different. The curvature of the border between a black and white line can be used to figure out how far you are from the center. So not homogeneous. So how about a checkerboard? Homogeneous less obviously non-isotropic, but there's a clear difference between going along one of the lines as opposed to going diagonally. Turns out to get both homogeneity and isotropy, really good words. Um, oh, that didn't sound good in this political climate. Um, to get homogeneity and isotropy, you need randomness. So you need something like this. So what does the universe look like on large scales. So this is an all sky image of the infrared sky with 44,000 galaxies being plotted. Infrared is used to reduce the effects of dust in our galaxy, but there's a dark band across the center um, where there's some dust and too many foreground stars to mess things up. But there's more information available from this. Color. So you can use the color to determine the distance because as I pointed out, the redshift changes the color. The, col the redshift is dependent on the velocity the object is moving, which depends on its distance. So this is the same data, but it's been mapped in three dimensions. We're at the center, and you get this sort of random bubbly shape which is exactly what you'd expect from a homogeneous isotropic universe. And hopefully you can see what this looks like. The, the lighting in here is pretty good. Here's the same data, um, or it's a slightly different um, data set. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and they've taken a slice through that data, and you can see the, the bubbles are more obvious. But that's what the universe looks like. On a very, very large scale, galaxies clump together in these clumps that are connected by sort of ribbons. Different colors, so first one was light on dark, here we have dark on light. So let's consider a universe filled with galaxies. Well, dots that represent galaxies. 
So please excuse the regularity of these dots. It's a lot easier to make a pattern like this than a random one. And it's a lot easier to see what I'm going to attempt to explain. So let's say these are all galaxies and we're on the one in the middle. If all the galaxies are moving away from us at a speed proportional to their distance, then in a little while, the distribution will look like this. Everybody see the change? You can go back and forth. That to that. Now, if we put one on top of the other, it looks like um, our galaxy has a case of cosmic halitosis and everything is rushing away from us. One of the most difficult intuitive ideas to accept is that's not what this says. What this actually points out is that any point is as good a um, candidate for the center of the universe as any other point. So yes, we are the center of the universe, but so is everywhere else. So we can sort of kind of see that if we take these images and move one relative to the other. And the center point changes just by considering any other point to be the center. Every place looks like the same victim of halitosis. So everybody see that? It's kind of a dramatic shift. Um, I put this up because of the way this is being presented. I put this up on, on YouTube a couple of days ago um, and forgot to make it a, um, a private video because it, it's only up here for the talk. And someone said, whoa, that reminds me of all sorts of cool stuff. I, oh well. So the third observation I'd like to point out is this. It's called the cosmic microwave background. So the basic idea of the Big Bang is that the universe is getting bigger and colder. Any idea why that would be the case? Why when something gets bigger does it get colder? Well, if you've ever pumped up a bicycle tire, when you compress things, they get warmer pump up a bicycle tire, the pump gets hot. So the inverse reaction is true. As you expand things, if you don't add energy, the average um, temperature goes down. So if the universe used to be smaller and hotter, then at some point in the past, it was hot enough to glow invisible light. So where is that glow? Well, it turns out the glow gets stretched by the expansion of the universe, and that's it. That's what the glow looks like when viewed in microwaves. So it's been expanded out from visible light to microwaves. Um, for those of you old enough to remember analog TV, <laughs> if you looked at a station that didn't have anything broadcasting on it, that snow, that static, about half of that was this, microwave uh, radiation from the Big Bang. Now, this is actually a terrible cheat. When you look at the microwave radiation from the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background, it's perfectly uniform, down to one part in 10,000 which is pretty remarkable. So expand those differences, you see these bumps. The effective temperature is um, uniform across to, to one, one thousandth of one percent across the entire sky, but for reasons which are very complicated, you can extract an amazing amount of information from these bumps and wiggles. So there have been three satellites built specifically to examine this. The first was called COBE, the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer. Um, the 
principal investigator for that, George Smoot, won the Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering that these irregularities exist. Uh, the next one was called WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. Told you that word would be useful. Um, and it got a better rendition of this. This is the result of the Planck satellite from the European Space Agency. The simplest version of the Big Bang makes predictions with just two free parameters. Not quite the one from gravity, but not so bad. How much stuff is there in the universe? And at some point, how fast is it expanding? General relativity tells us how that rate of expansion should change with time, depending on what the, the mass distribution is. But once you have these initial conditions, you can figure everything out. So given the observed expansion rate, we can say how old the universe is and whether it will expand forever. So roughly an analogy would be, let's say that there are two objects in the universe, me and my keys, and my keys are bound to me by gravity, which in this case, Earth is helping a bit. And I toss my keys away from me and they come back. Now, if I could toss my keys at 25,000 miles an hour, um, which would mean I would have a heck of a pitching contract um, and the ceiling would be a problem, the, my keys would go away forever. So is the universe going to do that? Will the universe expand and contract or will it just expand forever? Or is it going so fast that it'll not only expand forever, but it'll keep going quickly? So there is a critical density where the universe just barely stops at infinity. When we look at the rate of expansion of the universe and compare the density that we see to what we predict compared to this critical density, that number, that ratio is called omega. And if you look at the details of these bumps, and if someone asks me at the end, I can explain how. The distribution of bumps here tells us that omega to within 5% or so is one. We are right at the critical density. So we know how much stuff there is in the universe. Pretty cool. Well, what else can we figure out? Well, it turns out that if the universe was hot, really, really, I mean, really hot in the past, that's where the bulk of the helium in the universe was made. It wasn't made in stars, it was actually made in the Big Bang, along with a couple of other elements. So we can go through these computations, and based on different amounts of stuff, you get different ratios of helium to deuterium to hydrogen to lithium. So we do this computation, we get these curves, we then analyze how much of these things we get, and we discover that we're here. So the universe is 25% hydrogen, sorry, 25% helium, 75% hydrogen. Also some information about how much deuterium and lithium not only can be experimentally determined, but is theoretically predicted and everything matches up. So the, the axis on the bottom is the ratio of protons to photons in the early, early, early universe. So it's basically how much stuff there is. So we can put this, uh, so we get these um, observations from WMAP and we can then determine what the density of the universe is. And we find that omega is 0 0.05, which is not one. And I said before that our observation that it was one was good to about 
something's wrong here. Um, so we're going to decide that this value of omega only depends on normal atoms. So atomic matter is what this is sensitive to. So we can change this slightly. Now it's right. <laughs> the dense, the omega due to baryonic matter is 0.05. So we have quite carefully, consistently, scientifically determined what 1 20th of the universe is made out of. Um, which doesn't sound all that helpful, so let's, let's keep going. Observation number four, sorry, five, is that everything big has components that are going too fast. So this was noticed in a couple of contexts. The simplest one to understand. What is too fast? I will explain. The, uh, so there's a galaxy. And if you use a spectroscope, you can look at and see how fast stars on one side are coming to you and how fast stars on the other side are going away from you. And you know um, Newton's law of gravity. You can work out Kepler's laws of, of rotational motion. And the calculation says that you should get a curve like the red diagram that you see. What you get is the white line or white curve. So the velocity is too high. Things are going too fast. And everything big has this problem. So the other early consideration of this were clusters of galaxies. You have a bunch of galaxies flying around each other. There's gas inside these galaxies. But these galaxies are moving too quickly for the mutual gravitation of the galaxies to hold them together. They, the galaxy clusters should fly apart, but they don't. This gas was discovered. It turns out that it's hot enough to glow in x-rays. So we see a glow. Let's see if I can make this cute thing happen here. Oh boy, a laser pointer. So a bunch of galaxies, and this glow in between is hot gas. Now general relativity tells us that light can be bent by mass. So let's say we've got a galaxy way back here, and the light from it is going to go past this cluster of galaxies and get bent towards us. So instead of seeing the galaxy here, we'll see it out there because the light has been bent. This was predicted by Einstein. It's called gravitational lensing. And here's an example. We have a galaxy cluster. This is um, entry 1689 in the... Uh, George A. Bell catalog of rich clusters of galaxies. Uh, if you ever want to look this picture up, I think it's gorgeous. This is called A1689 for A. Bell 1689. If you uh, can see it, magic laser pointer again. So right here, there's a thin ring. There's another one over here. It's a little bit blue. There's another one over here and there. You can map out these distorted images of background galaxies and infer what mass was necessary to make these images. If you do that, you don't quite, well, let's, let's back up for a moment. Remember I said there was this hot gas inside of the galaxy, inside of these uh, galactic clusters. So this image is a combination of the visible light from the Hubble Space Telescope and a X-ray image from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which shows this diffuse glow of very low density, but extremely hot gas. So is this gas enough to hold the cluster together? 
What do you think? No. Turns out, not even close. It's a factor of 10 off, which is better than the factor of 20 we were off before, but no, not right. So we do the computation to figure out how much mass is there, whether we can detect it any other way or not. So using the gravitational lensing, we infer a mass distribution. And you'll notice a couple of things. It's not quite centered in the same place that this purple glow is, and it's lumpier. It tends to be clustered more around galaxies. So this is dark matter. Now it's matter, because what else are we gonna call it? And we'll get another name later. It's dark because we don't see it. And it doesn't seem to interact with anything other than gravity, uh, which is really unfortunate. But it has enough mass to hold galaxies together, to hold galaxy clusters together, and to account for the gravitational lensing of these galaxy clusters. So again, one number, the amount of dark matter in a cluster, accounts for all of these things. And a priori, there's no reason to expect these three different problems to have the same answer, but they do. So what else can we say about this stuff? So this is a great gift from the cosmos. Pretty picture, right? Not quite sure it's worth calling a great gift from the cosmos. All right. So this is a picture very much like the last one I showed for the different cluster. But this is two clusters that have collided and passed through each other. So the blue here is the dark matter that is determined by gravitational lensing. The pinkish orange, different color here than there. Oh, well, you know what I mean, is um, the X-ray glowing interstellar gas. So what do we notice? Unlike the previous picture, the center of the dark matter isn't anywhere near the center of the gas. So that tells us as these galaxy clusters pass through each other, most of the mass, the stars, and the dark matter just pass through each other without much trouble. The gas slams into each other, gets heated up, and gets sort of left behind. Gravity will eventually pull it into, into position. So one of the facts that is uh, well known to astronomers, but not so well known to normal people, is um, the distance between stars in a galaxy. So in about a billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is going to collide with the Milky Way galaxy. So our galaxy has, uh, say, 400 billion stars. Andromeda is a little bigger, say, five, 600 billion stars and they're going to do this. How many stars do you expect to collide when you pass roughly a trillion stars through each other? The answer is none. Why? Because even in dense parts of the galaxy, the stars are far apart. So f around here, and we're in a, a, a sort of dense-ish part of a spiral arm of the Milky Way, if stars were the size of grains of sand, they would be on average a meter apart. So there's lots of space in between. Now, the orbits of things are gonna get messed up and it may make for a really pretty sky, but we're not gonna get collisions. The gas, on the other hand, is going to interact. So you get this. So this is just what we would expect to happen for dark matter. A wonderful gift from the, from the universe. We have a, a, an observation that could either, you can never prove anything in science. The best you can do is disprove it. And this cooperates the uh, expectations. So if we model the extremely smooth distribution of matter, 
revealed by the cosmic microwave background as it develops, we see a pattern of galaxies and galaxy clusters that are predicted through time. So we should see this. This is a simulation of how both dark and regular matter should clump together, smaller according to the smaller regularity seen in the cosmic microwave background. The galaxies are being pulled apart by the expansion of the universe. Gravity is linking the smaller clumps whole together. Nothing went into these simulations except the rules of general relativity and the densities that we experimentally see. And we give, we get a distribution that looks an awful lot like the images that I showed at the beginning. So this is pretty good. High confidence that this model is correct, but there's still a problem. When we add the baryonic matter to the dark matter, we get something other than one. We get 0.3. It's a third as much stuff as we are expecting to see, which is better than a 20th. We're getting, getting better. Um, but we're still missing three quarters of the universe. And I've lost count of how many equation I've shown, but I probably lost more of the audience than that. But anyway, if we add more matter, even to the dark matter, it'll mess up these simulations. So there must be something else going on. So, this is general relativity in its most simple form. In fact, it's any equation in its most simple form. Um, I've, I've borrowed this uh, um, simplified version of general relativity from uh, Professor Lawrence Krauss uh, with his permission. Um, so anybody intimidated by this equation? Yeah, that, that, one, that one's pretty good. So slightly more detail the way space is curved depends on how much energy and momentum there is in that space so um as john archibald wheeler used to put it matter tells space how to curve space tells matter how to move so that's what gravity is it's space telling matter how to move in the presence of curved space from mass now that's really all you need to know about general relativity. But I can't help it. The standard notation is just too beautiful to pass up. Um, so this is almost the, uh, the current form of the simplest version of general relativity. We can add one more thing. This lambda is a, it's a term that works wasn't required, wasn't in Einstein's first version of things. Um, he had a problem. The first version of the, of the theory said the universe was dynamic. It was either expanding or contracting. And in um, 1915, when the theory was first published, there was no reason to believe that was true. So he put in this fudge factor so he could fudge things to make the universe stable. Turns out that this doesn't do that, but he thought it might. Um, then when the universe was seen to be expanding, he took it out, called it his greatest blunder ever. Um, and it is, of course, uh, sparked an enormous revolution in physics, uh, which is what you can do if, if you're Einstein. Um, his mistakes are, uh, his greatest blunders are, turn out to be profound statements. Steven Weinberg, a Nobel Prize winner in physics for his um, elucidation of part of what's called the standard model of particle physics. All of you that have seen press releases and stories about the Large Hadron Collider have heard of the standard model. Looked, um, he published a paper in 1987 to look for the implications of various values for this lambda character, though arrow pointing up. In 1995, Lawrence Krauss and Michael Turner even pointed out what the value should be to make the Big Bang work out, namely to make omega equal one, and gave several suggestions for how its presence would be revealed. And they noted, quote, in particular for a flat universe, one where 
lambda is one. With a cosmological constant, the distance to objects of a given redshift is much larger. So what sort of credence was given to this bold prediction that things should look for, should be much larger, much further away, uh, should seem to be much further away than they actually are? None. No one paid any attention to it at all because there were no observations to match it. So in 1999, people were trying to figure out the Hubble constant, the rate at which the universe slows down. And they didn't. They found instead that the universe, the expansion of the universe was accelerating. So by looking at really distant galaxies, you could see how the universe was changing billions of years in the past. And this actually caused a, a great deal of consternation among the, the groups. There were two of them. Um, and they were afraid to publish because they were sure they had screwed something up completely. And they had no idea how they could get anything so terribly wrong. There was one guy who was a member of both groups. And they were both getting the same wrong answer. So he went to the heads of, the other, of, bo of both groups and said, they're getting the same thing you are. So they published and the heads of the groups, not the guy that got them to publish, got the Nobel Prize. Oh, well. So how do we measure the distance to these things? So we use what's called a standard candle. So let's assume that um, the universe was filled with standard 100 watt light bulbs. Well, maybe brighter than that, 100 gigawatt light bulbs. And you could see, you know, or, or better yet, galaxies came with labels that said how bright they were. You know, three times the brightness of the Milky Way. Um, then you could look at the apparent brightness. You know how light loses brightness as it goes um, away from you or you from it. And you could deduce the distance. Well, the universe was nice enough to give us that cluster I showed you before, but not labels on the brightness of stars. But there was a set of stars discovered by a uh, person whose job title was computer. Um, computer was the job title given to usually women who did numerical work. They did computation. They computed things, so they were computers. Um, Henrietta Leavitt uh, was her name. And she noticed that a particular type of star that varied had a type of variation that was directly linearly related to its absolute brightness. So how could you do that if you didn't know the brightness and you couldn't measure the distance accurately? Well, she got pictures of a galaxy visible in the Southern Hemisphere called the Large Magellanic Cloud. So most of the stars in that galaxy are about the same brightness, are about the same distance. So any change in br relative brightness between them was just due to actual differences in their brightness, not differences in their distance. Analyzed, I think it was about 2,000 of these stars, worked out the relationship. Um, now she's getting credit for it, but it didn't happen for a while. That allowed Hubble to figure out the distribution of stars in our galaxy to tell that we were um, about 25,000 light years from the edge and the galaxy was a disk. Also allowed us to figure out the distance to other galaxies. These are called Cepheid variables and they're, they're great. They're almost like stars labeled with their brightness but they're individual stars. And when you go out to really distant galaxies, a billion, 10 billion light years away, you can't see individual stars. Well, most individual stars. Turns out every once in a while, stars do something rather dramatic. They explode. And they explode in something called, some of them explode in something called type 1a supernova. And when they do this, they are as bright as the entire galaxy they're in. Now, usually when people show images of 
type 1a supernova, they'll have a little arrow pointing to it and make a joke about how it's so convenient that, you, that nature gives you arrows to point out the supernovas. Um, is this one obvious enough that you can see it without the arrow? So let's, uh, so it's right there. So that little dot isn't over here. And that's a, that's a big boom. So this galaxy isn't super far away. It's actually visible in a pair of binoculars if you know where to look and you're in a dark enough sky. But all of these supernovas, whose distances we can measure in with other techniques like the Cepheid variables, all have exactly the same brightness. So this is like a standard candle. It's not a 100 megawatt or even 100 gigawatt. It's a big, bright candle. And we can see these across the entire universe. So we do a graph of all of the supernovas that we can see with the Hubble Space Telescope, figure out which ones are type 1a, graph the data, and we find that the orange lines on the bottom are the ones we expect in a normal universe that is decelerating, where gravity is slowing us down. And that's not what's happening. What we see instead is that gravity, anti-gravity, repulsive gravity, whatever we want to call it, the thing that general relativity explains predicts on these very, very large scales that the, acceler that the expansion of the universe should accelerate. And without tweaking the data at all, this energy that's predicted is 0.7 of this omega that we wanted. And remember what we had before, omega, the best estimate we could work out was 0.3, which gives us one. And we did this without cheating, really, trust me. The, uh, now, remember what I said before when I first showed this image, that if we add more matter, to make omega one, it would mess up this pattern and we wouldn't see the same sort of thing. So turns out that dark energy is kind of cool. Um, it's a constant amount of energy in the universe. So in order to make enough matter now, when you compress the universe back so that its expansion characteristics are determined, the energy, the, the matter becomes much denser. That doesn't happen with dark energy. It's completely non-intuitive. If you try to think about it, it will hurt your head. So stop. Um, you just have to trust the equations. So you still get this nice image. So let's take a look at a couple of different possibilities. On this vertical axis, we have how much stuff there is in this dark energy, what its omega value should be starting at minus one, negative amount of this energy, up to three, three times the critical density of that energy. And on the bottom, how much matter, both dark matter and regular matter, there should be. From nothing on the left to three times the density that we have. And there's a line where those two numbers add up to one which is the observed flat universe that we see with the cosmic microwave background. So when we do our analyses, what do we find? Other stuff on the screen. <laughs> Hi, Hunter. That's what I get for opening up. Hi. <laughs> so we can take three different completely independent data sets. The blue ellipse is the information we get from supernovas. And we can see that it's sensitive mostly to the ratio between dark energy and dark matter. And while looking at that data, we know that we must be somewhere in that cyan ellipse. We can look at clusters of galaxies, which is mostly what we're looking at is gravitational lensing, how much actual matter there is in the universe. 
And that tells us that we must be somewhere along this yellow ellipse. And we can use the green information from the cosmic microwave background, which mostly tells us that the, the um, universe is flat. Now, these are completely independent. There's no reason that these things should cross at a point. But they do. Well, I shouldn't say there's no reason. If we're right, and the universe is actually constructed this way, then that's what should happen. But nothing that went into any of the analysis for this required that. So three different, completely independent methods agree for what the universe is made out of. So what is it? It's 5% baryons, um, stuff that atoms are made out of. It's 25% dark matter, which is um, stuff. It's a highly technical term. And it's 70% dark energy, which isn't even stuff. It's a characteristic of the universe itself. And we have absolutely no idea what this is. Oh, but this, this is a science talk. So we need to put in um, uncertainties. Now, these uncertainties are probably smaller than they should be because we don't actually know all the errors we could make. Uh, so this is the best guess as to how far off we are. And we might adjust these numbers a little bit. But basically, the universe is made out of 5% normal matter, the stuff that makes up you know, atoms, uh, all the stars we can see. Then there's this other stuff which clumps together with matter. We can't see it, it doesn't emit any light, it doesn't absorb any light, it's the ultimate in dark, so we call it dark matter. And then there's this stuff that is the characteristic of the universe itself. It's what fits into the term that Einstein called his greatest blunder and turns out to be one of the fundamental constituencies of the universe, which is pretty good for a mistake. It turns out to be about 70% of the energy of the universe. And that's what we get. So the takeaway message is these numbers are the result of multiple independent experimental results. The fact that they all agree and agree well from independent analyses and approaches makes this a sound scientific result. Am I absolutely certain this is right? No. But in order for something to be more likely to be true, it's gonna to have to account for all of the data that I just showed you and all of the independent analyses all working out the same way. So if this isn't right, it's at least not wrong. It might be a little off. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, please. Do you wanna microphone the questions? Yeah, so... Uh... Matt and I are going to come around and uh, hand you a microphone when you have a question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, what was so absurd about that? Well, the, the idea, so if you had asked someone 100 years ago um, what the universe was made out of, um, or if someone said, What's the universe made of? And you told them 5% is made of atoms. And five times, of, uh, five times that is stuff that isn't atoms. And it doesn't interact with light or any electromagnetic radiation. It doesn't take part in nuclear reactions, which is why it doesn't affect the cosmic nucleosynthesis of elements. Um, but it's got gravity they'd say, yeah, right, why? And by the way, that's only 30% of the universe. The rest of it is this mysterious energy which causes the universe to accelerate in its expansion. Huh? Why? What, what possible reason? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. But when you have the evidence to back it up, it seems much more reasonable. Uh, 
if you ask someone uh, 2,000 years ago what the equations that determine how things move, when you take something and you push it, it moves until you stop pushing it. So force is necessary for motion. Well, that's wrong. There's friction involved, which no one paid any attention to. And if you push something, unless something slows it back down, it will keep moving. Newton's law of inertia. Was ridiculous. Nothing ever moves that way. You're sitting in ancient Greece, you don't have ice rinks. You can't, you know, push blocks of, you, you don't go curling and see these, you know, huge, how heavy are curling stones, Jay? Big 42 pound rocks sliding along and you just shove them, they go for a long ways. That's ridiculous until you actually get used to it. So most of us have heard about dark energy and dark matter. So we don't think of it as quite so absurd anymore, but it's kind of unintuitive. In the last equation you showed, everything added up perfectly to one. Right. And then you had your uncertainty. What, what, what is the uncertainty in the sum of them? And, and what is the uncertainty uh, in each individual? How, how is each uncertainty of the three numbers you showed? They all look like they were accurate to a, a couple percent. Where did that derive from? So um, the uncertainties, as I said, are probably the actual uncertainties are probably larger than this. These are the estimated uncertainties based on errors in the observations that result in these numbers. No. Yes. <laughs> but that's not where the numbers came from. The numbers came from the analysis of the data, and they're independent, and they, and they add to one. one to Correct. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, well, these, these, are, these are different data sets. And other versions of this don't add up. They're, they're off by a few. But um, now the, the errors add, uh, because they're independent, they add, you take the square roots and add them together and take the square root of the sum. They add in what's called quadrature to, to add the, uh, the errors up. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's surprisingly close. Um, now, there's, a, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens in experimental science. Um, and it's really hard to get around. If you look at a graph of the speed of light and the uncertainty in that number, it goes like this, shrinks, and then it jumps outside of the error bar. And then it shrinks again, and then it jumps. Because the errors are actually bigger than we think they are, because there are mistakes we could make that we didn't think of. Um, so the biggest error is probably in the error bar. I think people try to fit the data to what they want it to be. So what'll happen? No, no. So what'll happen is they go, all right, this is what I found. Is there anything else I should take into account? And they look and look and look and look, oh yeah, I should take this into account. And they keep doing this. Oh, I've got the right answer. I should stop now. Um, and knowing when to do that is something people are really bad at. So there are some experiments that have been done that deliberately avoid that problem. So there was recently a um, really long experiment, took about 40 years, called Gravity Probe B where they deliberately designed the experiment to avoid that problem. They had a massive systematic error that gave them a very, very wrong answer. And they didn't check to see what its value was until they were done evaluating everything else. And then they went, okay, I think I've got everything. I've double checked. Let's see what we got. And then they put, then they eliminate that, that systematic error. So they, they deliberately knew about this problem and tried to avoid it. And they got an answer that was good to about 10%, um, which is kind of amazing.
Um, but it's a problem. And in many cases, we don't know how to eliminate it like they could for Gravity Pro B. But it's a problem that we understand. And that's why I said the uncertainties are probably bigger than this. Any other questions? Go. Jay uh, said he was going to come to the talk and bring frozen tomatoes. I did not bring frozen Thank tomatoes. You. Um, he started off this talk talking about how science is an iterative process. Right. How we get better over time. Right. And um, you talked about how we have a very good understanding of 5% of the universe. There are people who we've both met, I'm sure, who would make the claim that you've just told me that science doesn't work. That um, if there were any phenomenon that we could describe with 5% certainty, and didn't understand the other 95% that you'd laugh at them. In fact, I would say that pseudoscience often does better than 5%. So are you telling me, have you, have you given the perfect talk that science is absurd? Well, obviously I don't think so. <laughs> um, but let me see if I can explain why. So, I haven't explained at all what dark matter is. I've only said a little bit about what dark matter does. There's a huge amount of stuff dark matter might do, and we have no idea. Same thing with dark energy. Where does it come from? Does it change over time? Um, we know that dark matter doesn't interact with the, the strong force or um, the electromagnetic force. It does interact with gravity. Does it interact with the weak nuclear force? We don't know. So there's a big difference. I think the, the crux to the answer is there's a difference between I don't know and you're wrong. So we've taken everything that we can determine with our current technology and with the observations that we've made and analyze things and fit them to our, our models. If our models turned out to not give a good fit, we, the talk would be different. We'd have a different model, but we don't know. There's one discrepancy between this lambda and lambda calculated. Okay, there's one big discrepancy between this lambda and lambda calculated using quantum mechanics, right? Uh, I shouldn't have brought that up. No, no that's fine. So um, we don't know what this lambda is. There's a guess for what things can cause lambda. Um, everyone's heard of this thing called quantum mechanics. Um, its uh, descendant is something called quantum field theory. And if you compute what the energy density of the universe is, according to quantum field theory, the answer you get is infinity. There should be an infinite amount of energy in every non-zero volume of space. This is clearly wrong. Now we know that quantum field theory isn't accurate below a certain size because it doesn't make any sense. So if we cut off the computation of quantum field theory to ignore things smaller than that, we discover that Omega um, in these units is um, 10 to the 120, maybe 10 to the 122. That's a big number. Um, it's a huge number. Um, it's bigger than the national debt number. It's, it's absurd, uh, even more than the title. but we don't know enough quantum field theory to be sure that that's the right answer. So um, this has been a, a, a well understood problem in physics for a long time. And uh, it resulted in a, in a comment from one famous physicist to another. Just because it's not infinity doesn't mean it has to be zero. So the assumption was that all of these numbers, for some reason, all the 10 to the 120th balances out with something else, and they all cancel out to zero. Turns out, maybe not. But we don't know if this lambda is, in fact, quantum field theory's vacuum energy. If it is, 
then we know what the right answer is and we don't know how to get it. But we just don't know. Uh, but yeah, this is, a, this is, this is wrong. Uh, 10 to the 120th, biggest error in computation or experimental verification ever made. Um, and this is actually the second time in the last century that physics has had this problem. Um, if you go back uh, 116 years ago, the, and you'd use the best equations available to figure out what light should come off of something that's 2,000 degrees. You know that it's this dull red glow. If you use the best science that they had at the time, the answer was an infinite amount of energy. Um, and if you graph the amount of energy that comes off, in the radio, you got about the right answer. In the infrared, you got about the right answer. You got sort of the right answer in the visible. And in the ultraviolet, what you see is a big drop off. And what they saw theoretically was this gigantic increase. So this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. It's only a catastrophe if you take your physics seriously, which I expect everyone to do. So this is another ultraviolet catastrophe. And for technical reasons, it's still called that. Um, the 120, 10 to the 120, really should be infinite. It's saying that we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120 is masking the problem. The problem isn't we're off by 10 to the 120. The problem is that we're off by an infinite amount. We are infinitely wrong. But since I didn't stake that number as being the quantum field theory vacuum, it might be. And if it is, then we, we know where to look. Um, but no. So the uh, type 1a supernova, stars that become a type 1a supernova, are they all about the same mass? And is that the reason they have the um, same brightness? So uh, stars that become type 1a supernovas are um, white dwarfs, which are, uh, can only have a maximum mass. Uh, it turns out if you do the computation for how big a white dwarf can be, um, this was first done by an Indian astrophysicist by the name of Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Um, I had to study to know how to pronounce that. We actually went, there's a space telescope, I mentioned it earlier, the um, Chandra Space Telescope, which was named after um, Professor uh, Chandra, as his uh, name is usually abbreviated. And he computed what the, what the diameter of a um, white dwarf type object should be. And it turns out that the heavier they are, the smaller they are. And at a certain mass, they become zero sized. And bigger than that, they're negative. So they, you can't make anything bigger than that of this type. So imagine a neutron star, or sorry, a, a white dwarf sitting there. It's got another star around it, bleeding gas off into it. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it hits this limit, the Chandrasekhar limit, and it explodes. And they're all the same mass because it's, they're all made out of the same stuff. So yeah, it's the same kind of thing. If the universe is expanding and that expansion is accelerating, is, there, is it ever going to get to the point where the gravity that even keeps stars together can't overcome that, that expansion? And what's so going to happen at that point? Um, so the uh, rate of expansion is determined by that omega value. If omega doesn't change, then the universe isn't gonna pull itself apart any more strongly in the future than it is now. So we're fine. Um, if omega changes, then galaxies will get torn apart, and then stars will get torn apart, and then planets will get torn apart, and then people, and then atoms, and it'll be bad. Uh, but there, there's, it's not going to happen for a long time if it'll happen at all, and our best indications are is that it won't happen. So 
Relax. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, do it's we have? Son, so. Yeah. Sorry. I'll, I'll be nice. <laughs> do we have any experimental evidence on what dark energy is, other than it has a value of point six nine one? It it seems very convenient to add up to one but we don't really know what it is. So the only evidence we have is that as near as we can, so there's a, there's a characteristic that relates what's called the pressure that this exerts on the universe um, compared to its energy. And if it's in fact this cosmological constant that Einstein put into his equations, then the, there's a ratio there that should turn out to be minus one. And it is. So we know it fits that characteristic. It's not, it's not stuff. It's some characteristic of the universe itself. We see no indication that it varies through time or space. There are experiments currently being done to try to look for small changes in what lambda is over here compared to what lambda is over there. Now, I don't mean here and there. I mean a billion light years this way and a billion light years that way or more. Um, and the, there are experiments currently underway and being designed to answer exactly that question. Does lambda change? Does it change? Is it different in, through at different points in space? Is it different in points in time? What the heck is it? And the answer is right now we have no clue other than it seems to be uniform. In terms of, how do you know that the mass isn't just something that is like, uh, you know, like it's still like little small things that aren't, don't interact with the light, but they're kind of little small condensation, not dust or, or light. Because, how do you know that it's not if, baryonic? if they were baryons, then they would take part in the nuclear reactions in the first few minutes of the universe where the hydrogen, helium, deuterium, and lithium were made. And the, that chart that I showed, there's probably a better way to do this. There we go. Um, would get a different answer. So if there was more stuff, then instead of, oh, got it over there, not over here. Um, if, you, uh, if you increase the amount of stuff, then that line would go to the right and we would see less helium uh sorry less helium three and slightly more helium four and a lot less deuterium than we actually see so, so in some sense as a fudge factor to make this curve come down right no so when when this was first done this was a tremendous embarrassment um we knew the right answer we knew omega was one and you do all the computations and you do the analysis and you get omega is 0 0.05. Uh, so the theory says that omega of baryonic matter is 0 0.05. So if there was any more of that stuff, if the dark matter or dark energy were baryonic matter, we'd get different numbers here. So that's, that's one of the things that's that's best understood. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very, everybody for coming. And uh, if you didn't know, we are going to meet at the Firehouse Grill in Sunnyvale uh, right after this for drinks. So if you'd like to meet us there, we'll see you there.